I'm delighted to welcome you to this event entitled The Nature Restoration Regulation Implications for Ireland and Europe. And we're very pleased to be joined uh, today by Minister of State for Land Use and Biodiversity, Senator Pippa Hackett, um, who will address us um, shortly. That legislative proposal uh, that I mentioned, uh, the Nature Restoration Regulation, is, as uh, you're aware, part of the EU biodiversity strategy, aiming to restore ecosystems across the European continent uh, for people, climate, and the planet. The ambitious proposal aims to cover at least 20% uh, of the EU's land and sea areas by 2030, and ultimately all ecosystems in need of restoration by 2050. I think it can be fairly said that it is far-reaching legislation. It has generated much uh, political debate, both here in Ireland and across Europe, and we're delighted to be able to hear the Minister's insights on the proposal ahead of a critical vote uh, tomorrow. Senator Pippa Hackett has served as Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine since June 2020. She's responsible there for the land use and biodiversity portfolio. Ms. Hackett is herself an organic farmer and holds an undergraduate degree in agricultural science and a PhD in equine science. Pippa Hackett was first elected as a senator for the agriculture panel in a by-election in 2019 and was re-elected to Shannon uh, in 2020. Upon the formation of the current coalition government, she was appointed Minister of State with, as I say, responsibility for land use and biodiversity. Uh, she holds a singular honor, uh, if I may say so and remind you, as the first senator to have been appointed as minister as a minister of state. Under the constitution, as we know, it is possible for there to be a maximum of two members of Shannon in cabinet. Um, and that has happened on very, very few occasions in the history of state, as far as I know, I think twice in the past, twice previously. But this is the first occasion um, on which a, a member of Shannon was appointed as a minister of state. Uh, which uh, is, I'm sure, uh, a great honour for, for uh, Minister Hackett, and we're delighted to, um, to have her here this afternoon. So um, the Minister will speak for about 20 minutes or so, either way, 15, it doesn't matter, in or around, no, not maybe much more than 20 minutes, and then we'll go into a Q&A session um, with the audience. Both those of you who are here who'd like to ask a question, you'll just have to put up your hand, that's, the, that's easy, because I can see you. And if you're watching and joining us remotely, there's a Q&A function that you know all about at this stage, which you'll see there on your screen. Send in your question, if one occurs to you, when it occurs to you, rather than waiting uh, to the uh, waiting uh, for later when we might tend to get a, a bunch of them in. So do it when, the, when it occurs to you and we get to that question once Minister Hackett has finished her presentation. You can also participate in the discussion on Twitter if you're minded to do that using the handle at IIEA. Both the presentation and the Q&A are on the record in case there's any doubt about that. Um, and without any further ado from me, I'm delighted to hand you over now to Minister of State for Land Use and Biodiversity, Senator Pippa Hackett. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Now, my mic is on, is it? I think so. Good. Listen, don't worry, the font is quite big on this, so hopefully we won't overrun into the 20 minutes. Uh, but listen, thank you very much, Alex. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to thank Barry, Hannah, and Nisha as well for their work on this event. I think it is, it's timely, um, the events in the parliament tomorrow, um, and I want to set out why I think nature restoration law is positive for Ireland and for Europe. Um, I think it's no doubt, nobody can deny that biodiversity and our, our precious natural ecosystems are under massive threat from our, our very existence and the way we, we live our lives and the way we consume and the way we do absolutely everything. Um, so I suppose I'll start by saying that restoring nature should not be controversial. The process of rejuvenating and preserving our natural ecosystems from forests to wetlands, as well as improving and greening our urban environment for the benefit of present and future generations is a good and noble cause. It is a path towards a sustainable and resilient future where we recognize the integral role that nature plays in our lives, our communities and our economy. While the nature restoration law has been a topic of robust debate in recent weeks, it is vital to understand the potential benefits it can bring, rather than focus solely on the unfounded concerns on its effects on agriculture, which I will speak about more a little later on. 
The roles, jobs and land management practices of the future will be very different from today. And with that in mind, the nature restoration law, in my view, has the capacity and the potential to revitalize and invigorate rural Ireland, breathing new life into our agricultural communities, transforming our towns and cityscapes, and making this country a better place to live. But to get to that destination, we must move beyond the perception that the concept of nature restoration is a threat to farming or rural life. It is our duty to explain this and talk about it at any opportunity we can, which is part of why I am here today. In fact, as politicians, we must commit to engage not only in the debate, but in the forming of this law in Europe and in working proactively to provide the policy solutions needed. We need our politicians from all parties to engage on this law, to sit around the table, make their views known, and bring in their influence to bear on helping to shape a law that works for us all. Now is the time to embrace the incredible opportunities it presents. What no politician should do now is vote this law down and walk away from the debate. As many of you will be aware, the council last week reached an agreement on its general approach. I was in Luxembourg last week with ministers Ryan and Noonan when this was agreed. And there was a genuine sense of optimism and positivity when agreement was reached. So much so, the room actually broke into applause, which was very heartening to see. The council agreed to keep ambitious goals for nature restoration, but has provided flexibility for member states in the implementation of the regulation. While for some, this does not go far enough, for others, it is too far. Some such as the precarious nature of politics and reaching agreement, but agreement we must reach and it must be put, put us on the right road to restoring our damaged nature. As many of you will be aware, there are three aspects to law creation at an EU level. Typically the European Commission writes the law and the member states through the relevant councils and the MEPs through the parliament come to their own agreements before the final discussions take place in trialogue negotiations. The Commission continues to defend, as expected, the original drafting of this law. However, recently, especially in response to the issues within the Parliament, they are showing more flexibility. For example, they have said they are willing to engage with the Parliament and Council on the issue of financing. The Rapporteur in the Envy Committee in Parliament proposed more ambitious restoration and rewetting targets for drained agricultural peatlands which combined with other elements led to the EPP, the European People's Party, issuing a statement that they were withdrawing from the process. Within the Parliament, both the Fisheries Committee and the Agri Committee have rejected the Parliament's proposals. However, recently there has been a softening of the proposals in an effort to win sufficient support. The Envy Committee started to vote on the proposals last June the 16th. However, due to time constraints, this process continues tomorrow, the 27th of June. This will be a very important vote. And I hope that the EPP make the correct decision on what can be a very positive development for everyone. So after the vote tomorrow, we will know a little bit more. But the text agreed to last week is now the council's mandate for negotiations with the European Parliament on the final shape of the legislation in the coming weeks and months. Unfortunately, and sadly, the concept of restoring nature, specifically through this nature restoration law, has divided political parties both at here in Ireland and in the European political sphere. Perhaps it is the word law that has frightened the horses here, but the law will only be one aspect. It is the implementation of its requirements that will require those with solutions to come to the fore. Those who are blindly opposed to this law are not interested in the solutions. They are the ones who see nothing wrong with our current way of life, our current consumption model. If we chain ourselves to preserving our current way of life all of the time, we limit progress and stifle any sense that there is a better way. Here at home, we have many politicians railing against the idea in very strident terms, which in turn makes the public feel uneasy and turns, to the, turns the concept into a partisan and highly charged debate. From my own engagement on the issue, I think the public is far more in tune with the potential good in this law rather than the perceived threats. 
There's been a lot of conjecture and indeed legitimate questioning focusing on farmland and the potential impact this law may have on the viability and livelihoods of farmers across this country. Let me say clearly, the text the Council has agreed would provide flexibility for Member States in the implementation of the regulation. What that means is that we as a government will have flexibility on how we implement measures to restore nature. And this is a government that has worked with farmers over the past three years on a range of environmental schemes, many of which are already helping to restore nature. And we will continue to work with farmers into the future. That will not change. Since I have taken up my role in the Department of Agriculture, I have seen firsthand how Irish farmers demonstrate their commitment, not only to sustainable agricultural practices, but to nature. And many have embraced the environmental schemes with enthusiasm. Farmers, as we know, are the custodians of the vast majority of the land in this country. I'm a farmer myself, and I know the deep rooted connection we have to our rural heritage and the innate understanding of the relationship between farming and nature. In recent years, Irish farmers have recently taken, taken up the challenge to implement eco-friendly practices. Their enthusiasm is borne out more recently to the huge numbers who have subscribed to the Acres scheme and the thousands who have moved to organic farming practices over the past couple of years. They are engaged across the country as they strive to reduce their carbon emissions, enhance biodiversity, and adopt innovative techniques that promote soil health and water quality. I know that many of them feel a great sense of responsibility towards future generations, their children and their children's children. They are conscious that they must pass on a farm that can remain profitable for those coming next, but also a farm that is sustainable in a world where the consumer of the goods they produce is becoming ever more conscious of the origin and footprint. Farmers in Ireland are already paving the way for a greener, more sustainable Ireland, where agricultural practices harmonize with nature. What we cannot allow is that sense of ownership and enthusiasm be damaged by conjecture and whataboutery around the nature restoration law, which is the biggest threat to its progression that I have seen at the moment. So I want to tell you what the nature restoration law is and what it is not, specifically in relation to agriculture. I want to explain why it is something we should embrace, not fear. At its very core, this is an EU-wide move to reverse decades of decline in biodiversity mm. by encouraging member states to bring ecosystems back into good condition. Within that piece of work, there will be ambitious goals to restore habitats for flora and fauna, to restore woodlands, rivers and oceans with valuable benefits for climate, water quality, agriculture and the wider economy. A huge amount of the debate is centered on the rewetting of agricultural land. Rewetting is only one aspect of the nature restoration law. And this, the definition means to raise the level of the water table on those peaty soils that were previously drained. In the medium term, we in Ireland have the capacity to meet these rewetting targets within state owned lands. These are lands of Ford Lamona and Quilcha and other parcels in the ownership of the state. That is where the focus will be and that is where the targets will be met. But for those farmers who wish to play their role in restoring wetland nature, and believe me, they are out there. We want to support them. These lands can be difficult to manage at the best of times. And the farmers are the real experts here. Their knowledge and skills will be needed to manage these lands into the future. If anyone has seen the movie, The Field, I'm sure you, most of you have, I hope. Um, I don't know for sure, but that image of uh, the bull McCabe looking over that green field in a uh, bright green and, and the rough land around it um, shows how entrenched we are and farmers are with their land. Um, having to drain that and manage it was, was a sense of massive achievement for, for families and for generations. So there's that deep connection, very deep rooted connection to the land. And certainly, as I said, as a farmer myself and, and being married to a farmer, um, I'm very well aware uh, that the best way to sink this proposal would to be go after that farmer's land, tell them that what they must do and accept that Europe and the government knows best. That is not what will happen. And that is not what we will do. But that doesn't stop the hysterical debate. 
Some of you may have seen a debate on this issue in the Dáil a number of weeks back, when I referred to a deputy who was formerly an organic farmer as an organic farmer. It drew such an outlandish and hysterical response that it made me reflect on the wider context on which this law is being fought against. In some cases, not on fact, but on conjecture and pure politics of fear. My colleague, Minister Charlie mcconnell Oke has also stated clearly that we have the capacity to meet re-wetting targets within state-owned lands, not on private farms. Yet some choose not to listen and continue with the fear-mongering. But we cannot rule out farmers also benefiting from the nature restoration law on a voluntary basis if they feel their land is suited and if they want to. And any scheme for farmers to engage in nature restoration, such as re-wetting, will be entirely voluntary. We respect the autonomy of our farmers and acknowledge that they are best positioned to make decisions that suit their individual circumstances. The Irish government will support, will encourage and provide necessary resources to those to cho who choose to participate in such initiatives. But we will never impose or force anyone into actions they deem unsuitable. However, based on the enthusiasm for and the uptake of current agri-environmental schemes, we expect that demand for such schemes to be much greater than the requirement when state lands are factored in. There have also been concerns raised about the compulsory purchase orders on farmland and the nature restoration law. Minister Raymond Ryan has unequivocally stated that compulsory purchase orders will not be used in the context of nature restoration. Again, this would be an approach that would not engender any enthusiasm from the, the general public or indeed the government. We are well capable as a country to reap the benefits of this regulation without even considering compulsory purchase orders. We are committed to open dialogue, transparency and the respectful exchange of ideas. We value the contributions of our farming communities and acknowledge their indispensable role in shaping the restoration of nature and we will remain open to their ideas and concerns and suggestions as this moves forward. But this is not just about farming and rural Ireland. It is so much more. It's also about urban settings, cities, towns and villages across Ireland and across Europe. It will promote the establishment of green infrastructure in urban areas. Green spaces such as parks, gardens and urban forests can be integrated into cities to enhance biodiversity, and improve air quality. In fact, as, as the Europe's climate is changing, we're seeing hotter summers, these trees and these green areas are going to provide um, support for vulnerable people who live in cities um, in the years ahead. There are many cities without enough trees, and I think you know we, we shouldn't think that we, we will escape this in years to come. These also in urban areas will allow us to cre create habitats and corridors for wildlife in these environments. It will help improve air quality by increasing the number of trees and plants that absorb pollutants and release oxygen. And additionally, restoring and preserving natural wetlands and green areas can contribute to a better water quality by filtering and purifying runoff before it reaches urban waste systems. It will also have a positive effect for our health and well-being. Access to nature in urban areas has been linked to numerous health benefits. Restored urban green spaces can provide opportunities for physical activity, stress reduction, and mental relaxation. It can help build communities through nature restoration projects in urban areas as well as rural areas, where communities and groups can engage and raise awareness about the importance of preserving and enhancing what they have. I've seen this firsthand across the country throughout the many life and EIP projects my department supports in conjunction with the MPWS. And these projects, coincidentally, are also funded by the European Union. Many of these projects bring communities together to preserve and protect, and it's a model that works. Projects like the Burren Project in Clare, or the Mac Hare Project along the West Coast from Donegal to Kerry. So we are already restoring nature in many areas, and now the same can be true for our cities too. By involving local residents in the planning, the implementation and the maintenance of green spaces, the law can foster a sense of ownership and community cohesion. In summary, this law has the potential to enhance all of our lives. 
Restoring nature can enhance the visual appeal of every environment in which Europeans live. Cities, towns, villages, and isolated rural settings. It can make each of them more attractive places to live, work, and visit, and overall improve the quality of life in these areas. This is about place and the connection people living there have with that. So what are the next steps and how do we make sure we get this over the line? The key issue now will be how the European Parliament's proposed text develops, and in particular, how closely it aligns with the Council's general approach. Within the Parliament, the Envy Committee is due to resume voting on the proposed amendments tomorrow, and a full plenary vote is scheduled for the 10th of July. Assuming the Parliament establishes its general approach, the trialogue process can commence, and I really hope that it can. Nature simply can't afford for politicians to walk away from the table on this. However, if there are significant differences between the Council and the Parliament's respective positions, the trialogue process will be more difficult. European Parliament elections are due to place, take place next June, and that is something we cannot shy away from. We need this process completed before this parliamentary term ends. For a more local point of view, this is certainly not just a Green Party issue. Here at home, Fianna Fáil support this at European level, as do Sinn Féin. Big businesses like Nestle, Coca-Cola, Danone and Salesforce all support this. Thousands of scientists have backed it. And from my travels as a minister to farmyards and other events across the country, once explained, people can see the benefit this brings to all walks of life. This is a rural and an urban issue. Restoring nature can happen everywhere. This isn't rural versus urban. And anyone who fuels that narrative is playing politics with nature, playing politics with biodiversity, and playing politics with the future of our planet. Together, we can make this country a better place to live. And I hope that this talk has given you a sense of where we are right now. And I also hope it gives you some hope for how positive this can be for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister. And you've set out your stall, or you have been setting out your stall on this issue with um, some uh, considerable force. And thank you for the clarity of what you've had to say. Um, where I was wondering, just listening to the, you know, the trajectory or what's going to happen next and so on, goes to the part of the trilogue, just all of that. And assuming just for a moment that, um, as you hope, that the regulation ends up being enacted, comes through. As I understand it, then the next step then is member states have to develop their own restoration plan. So that would, so a period would then ensue where each member state would, have, would be required by the regulation to develop a plan. Obviously the plan would have to be in compliance with what's in the regulation. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, it, it, I think there might be a two year process for that or something. Yeah. I'm just wondering, when you, bearing in mind the, you know, the various, I mean, there's been opposition expressed to it in some cases, perhaps, as you've suggested, that may, there may be an element of, you used the word hysteria, but I'm sure you'll acknowledge in other areas there'll be genuine worries and concerns about what, what, it, mean, what it might mean for them and so on. So what, what, what opportunity is there during that period, the preparation of the plan period, for you know, a I mean, obviously it's a regulation has direct effect. But what kind of opportunities are there to, we'll say, negotiate or look at the application of the plan in the Irish context and take on board maybe some of the concerns? Yeah. Um, I, I think the opportunity should be should be vast in that stage, and mm. if we can get over the line in terms of the, the figures and the facts. I mean, at the end of the day, the law will be you know, it, it's guiding or, you know, it's, it's obligatory, but it's, mm. it's, it's figures and it's hard to, tan, you know, make that tangible to people on the ground. What does that mean? And, and, and that is probably where a lot of the fear lies. It's a little bit like the, um, our climate targets from last mm. year, around this time last year, you remember the debates and mm -hmm. was ag going to go to 28 or 26 or 25? And it was, you know, this tension that was there. And again, we, we settled on the figure, but we still have to implement what that means and in a way that's the exciting bit this is where you need the people with the solutions who are genuinely interested to come together um and and to to propose the solutions um and i think that's that's where it becomes more tangible for for farmers and, and people across on the ground 
when we see, ah, that, oh, I can do that. You know, that's what that means. Or, oh yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, to do that element of it. I mean, and I think we, it's, there's always a sense like we're just, we're just waiting for the law and we're waiting for the climate targets to be set and we're not doing anything until that happens. I mean, certainly since this government was formed, we've acted on those from the, from the get-go. Um, within my own area, like I'm responsible for, for organic farming, we've seen like a, nearly a, a trebling of the numbers of organic farmers in, in three years, two, coming up on three years. Every one of those farmers who's moved from a, you know, a, a system maybe based on, on chemical inputs to, to ones that don't, they, they, they're helping to restore nature. They're, you know, making improvements for their water quality, they're improving their soil health. Um, so there's a lot of things that have happened, certainly any of those projects I alluded to as well in the speech, there's life projects, there's, there's a lot of engagement already, and it might just mean more of that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then that's a little bit more tangible. We talk about, um, I mean, there's examples of even rewetting projects on farmlands um, in the Midlands, which are quite a big area, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. those drained areas. Um, and there's, there's small scale, okay, at the moment projects, but there are examples of how it can work. Um, and somebody said, I think last week in, in some one of the debates, like we need we need to have pilot farms. You know, we're not doing anything until we see how it can be done. There are examples already there. So I think it's maybe about building that up, um, building up the trust. And I think the best way to do that is not from top down. It's very much from grassroots and from a peer to peer, from farmer to farmer. And I think that's where we need to be aiming for. So, as you say, in relation to the tar the climate targets, it's sort of. Well, how would you describe it? Kind of like the the end of the beginning, so to speak. So the numbers go down on the page, but it then becomes a process yeah. of of negotiation, perhaps, or at least um, an opportunity for the thing then to take on its to take on a life where it really happens, rather than simply just be something that's uh, prescribed. I think by so. Law. It's, it's not. We're not in the dark either. We, right. we roughly know what we need to do. Yeah. Just and just on the public private, because. You said Minister McConnell had said that in his view, and you you endorsed that, that perhaps the great majority of the heavy lifting, if I can use that term, would could, could be done or on public lands. Certainly in the, that, the medium term over the next you know, yeah, two decades anyway. 20, yeah, yeah, and if right. not more, um, that that though the figures show for themselves, certainly in terms of board and Mona land, we know they have a very um, extensive rewetting program that they're yeah. embarking on currently and have been doing so. And then there's a quite a lot of quilcha land, which people might be surprised to know that um, are on, on, on peaty soils, um, a lot of areas that should never have been planted, you know, mistakes mm. have been made in the past. I think we've been open in acknowledging that. Um, and, and those areas will either never, you know, won't be replanted or will just be drains maybe blocked and just let nature take its course. And on that point, I mean, is that do you, I mean, you can't speak for the opponents, but they have to speak for themselves mm. uh, for, of the regulator. But is that accepted? I mean, if that's being said by government that most of this can be done on public land, is that is that not is that accepted or is that acknowledged? It, seem, it seems it's not. When in, from some of the the narrative and some of the dialogue, it does seem that that isn't being accepted. Um, it comes down to trust. Then you know, are we, yeah. are we just fooling you here? But uh, you know, the, the acreage and the hectareage is there, and and the details are there for everyone to see. It's not a secret how much land is in state ownership and how much of that is peat based. Um, I think that's that's there to be seen. Um, and if and you know, with that in mind, that gives us a, a quite a long run in to engage with farmers and work out what works. Mm. Um, what doesn't work um, and build on some of those pilot projects that are in existence at the moment. I mean, there is a, one of the things that I suppose I, I remember from my own time, like dealing with the wind energy issue, like there is actually an extraordinary amount of land in public ownership and, yeah. and directly owned by the state or by, by mm -hmm. state institutions or agencies or the money you mentioned, Quilta. Um, and this is just the question that occurred to me just as you were speaking, and it may it may not make any sense at all what I'm about to ask you. But I remember being briefed and often arguing that you know when there was a, a controversy about the wind energy guidelines, you know the setback distance for for wind turbines, that we could do an awful lot of that work on state land and on Bordemona land, for example, um, and and deep Quilcha. I mean, could the two things coexist? They could. I mean, I, I live quite close to Mount Lucas Wind Farm. And yeah. look, when you think of like the extent of particularly Bordenamona land across the Midlands, mm -hmm. I mean, there aren't houses on the land, yes. you know, so it is, we have a very di 
diver, you know, dispersed, mm. unfortunately, in one sense, unfortunately for nature restoration and unfortunately for a whole host of things that dispersed rural um, and uh, uh, settlement pattern and that is a challenge um but a lot of the board namona land isn't really because it was all board namona land nobody was mm. building houses on those areas so they have become the natural um host site for a lot of wind farms and certainly mount lucas was one of the biggest ones at one stage um and it you know there aren't there are houses right at the periphery and but in terms of the the, the area size it's, it's not an issue now they have some of those drains on that land as well are blocked you know because at the end of the day the turbines are are on raised mounds and there's um you know raised roads to access them but the rest is all is all peatlands um and that would be suitable for uh, yeah and you can yeah. see it now you can so, see yeah. it how it's yeah. returned a bit i was there on saturday and you know there's a variety of of you know um, biodiversity and and uh plants and, and species returning it has done for sure. the past couple yeah. of years i don't want to, i don't want to get go, go into, i'm the one who brought up wind wind energy sorry about that we don't want to go into that area necessarily today but it's just an interesting thing i was wondering could the two uh, i think so. exist and from what I, you're saying I think so, yeah maybe yeah depending on the side. So gentlemen, I'm just add one yeah, of course one absolutely yeah i suppose on the, the fear factor mm. with with farmers in particular um it's it's the financing of this mm. um and what you lose out on I mean, and and that that's going to have to be multi-annual. We can't. It, it's not about. I mean, we, while we have pilot schemes, you know, they're five-year programs. What happens after that? You know, what happens when I've done my five years and my field is is fabulous for for nature and and you know carbon storage? What happens yeah. then? That's that's what we need to sort out, and that's what the European Commission needs to sort out. Um, and and that would be crucial to this being a success. That the financing of it would be, yeah, a farmer could see that it's sustainable into the future so long absolutely. term. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, we do, um, we support farmers, you know, through the Common Agricultural Policy Budget. And that's, you know, we've been trying to, I suppose, green that up over the, each reform of that, it's getting a bit greener in terms of, and I don't, I mean, with small g, um, but, you know, if you listen to some of the concerns, it's it's nowhere near good enough and it's, you know, it's tinkering around the edges. So we do need to really get hold of this. If we're serious about nature restoration, you do have to you have to put the funds behind it. Gentlemen here. And uh, sorry, I should have said if you're going to ask a question and we love if you did either here or online, please give your name. And if you have a designation or you're representing an organization, you might tell us that as well, but especially your name. Sir. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. My name is John Connor. I'm a simple uh, member of the institution. I might as well, I suppose I must declare an interest. Uh, I'm a farmer. Um, I had a political existence in the past with an EPP party. And uh, I do live in an area where the soils are very peaty, but I live in the area where the Office of Public Works um, drained the main water system, you know, by arterial drainage, which had a huge difference on the landscape. And I myself and hundreds of other farmers engaged in a scheme called the Western Drainage Scheme. You wouldn't know about it. It was there in the 1970s. And uh, thousands of acres, hectares, thousands of hectares were uh, reclaimed, we said at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, what just worries me, now, incidentally, I support fully the thrust of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. Mr. Or what we, we, we need to do this, I accept that. But I can see, because I live among farmers, and I'm one of them, and you know, part of that culture, uh, their fears, and they need to be they need to be handled sensitively, you know. But for instance, the, the state in my part of the world maintains a, um, a drainage maintenance program of ensuring that the channels of the streams and the drains and the main channel itself, say, of the Boyle River system, are maintained. Still, just taken out every four years keep the water flowing. That's very important, but will it continue under this new scheme uh, of things, I wonder? Um, I don't know, uh, to be honest. I mean, there are challenges with, with you know, continually going into rivers and removing silt. And I suppose you have to what, back up a step and what, what, how is the silt getting into the river? I certainly know in my area in the River Shannon, like a lot of the, the silt is, is peat. From the bogs and and you know and there's a lot of calls for for um for um sorry what's the term for um not dredging sorry dredging thank you dredging the the shannon um but 
and the, the issue actually with the Shannon as an example is for two two reasons. I mean, the, they they keep the, the level of the Shannon artificially high to allow all the navigation on the Shannon. Um, but I think you know if we could get on if if some of this helped deal with um, how the silt's getting into rivers in the first place, then that would be helping nature in those rivers because scooping out the bed every couple of years or however often it's done isn't really good for nature. And and that's another that's another argument and another discussion I think. Could I just uh, somewhat in an unorthodox way ask you, John, what do you think are the kinds of things that government should be doing and saying that might reassure people who have concerns? If you don't mind my asking that question. Yeah. The minister was very eloquent today in, in, uh, in, in setting it out. And in fact, I, I watch these. I'm a former public representative myself. And I watch and listen to these things. But, you know, somehow I heard greater clarity today what it's all about and the assurances that there won't, nobody will do it by compulsion. But remember, it will never be fully successful unless it applies to these areas that engage in a massive way in re reclamation. You know, the, one of the greatest political issues for, for generations in my part of the world was the drainage of the River Shannon. And that not just the Shannon Main River, but all of the tributaries that serve it. And one of the tributaries that I ever alluded to, the Boyle one, which is one of the biggest tributaries of the Upper Shannon, mm. you know, and... Uh, Farmers, I honestly think, Minister, it's, you, it'll never be solved. And I think pressure will come on to ensure that much of the farms, are, like myself, who de-wetted hectares of land with, 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 very, with so much assistance that it hardly cost us anything, yeah. you know. And people are very fearful of that. And that issue of the, of the Board of Works, as we call it, coming back every four years and cleaning up the channels and making sure where the weed growth is and where the silts, you will know, always get silt banks moving in any river. There isn't a river in the world, I'm sure. It doesn't have, you know, something like silt or gravel or moving, you know, and building up in, in banks, in the, and which, of course, restricts the flow. Hmm. You had the okay. Somerset Broads or whatever they called them in England a few years ago, and it caused huge damage after a flood. And it was all put down to poor maintenance at the end of the day, mm -hmm. because maintenance had stopped. I think you raise an important point about when we were um, subsidising farmers decades ago to, to reclaim land, and it was perceived as a very positive thing because it was going to enable production and all of these positive terms. And this has been perceived as the almost the opposite. We have to, in one sense, in the years and decades ahead, is redefine what production is. You know, what, what is productive farming? And okay, it's very much at the moment focused on food and that's it. It's far bigger than that. Um, it's, it's going to be a far bigger um, delivery of those services to the state and services to community and society. And that's a bit of a mindset change. And while food production is absolutely, you know, it's essential, you know, to what we do, there are other essential things too, and we will be relying on farmers to maybe change how they manage to, 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 to serve society. What does society want from our land? And that, you know, that's what, partially what we're trying to answer in our land use review. And again, that's probably a debate for another time as well, but it's intrinsically linked to this. You know, this is what, what do we want from our land? What do we want it to deliver for us as an Irish society? Because we only have a finite amount of it. Um, and you already see challenges there um, in terms of, well, where are we going to get all this land for, for mm. all of these things we want to do? And we have to work that out. We take a slight detour away from farmers and rural Ireland and just ask you, because it occurs to me that there will be some implications at least uh, and some opportunities um, in the urban situation where urban ecosystems um, might come in, in, you know, become under, uh, be given attention as well by this, this new measure. Do you want to say something about that and what are the, what's the potential or what is the possible application of this new law to the urban uh, context? Um, I think when you look at where our people live as well in Ireland, you know, vast majority do live in towns and cities and they all, I think, treasure their their spaces you see the 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 protests that come about a few trees i'm being flippant now but a few trees get removed in a in a some street nice suburban street somewhere um and you know in one sense rightly so but i suppose it's it's been done for a reason or whatever the reason might be is that the necessary trade-off that's that's a, that's a different matter but certainly i i think in terms of um all of those things that that green 
environments in urban areas besides the sort of maybe the health benefits and the, the psychological well-being of, of individuals it's the actual um services it provides to people living in cities so whether it is um air quality or noise pollution i mean i think anyone who has a hedge or anything outside their urban home and if they're sitting at the back they'll know that it makes a difference um uh, and water regulation as well is going to be a big issue i mean even last was it last week we had the big downpour and you know you know that county councils and city councils are thinking god right i hope everything works and hope everything can can, can hold this and last year for um, St. Patrick's Day, I visited Greece and in Athens, like it's a, you know, it's a fairly significant city. But when you look down over it from some wonderful cathedrals and wherever I had got the pleasure to visit, um, it's 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 wall to wall. There's very little green spaces. And they were one of the first European cities to um, put in place a heat officer. I think they're the first one. I don't know if others have done it since because the the, the heat has increased so much over the last number of decades and the the, the, the deaths due to that, which they don't actually identify as related to heat, but the numbers of, of unexpected deaths go up quite dramatically during a, a you know a heat wave there. Like the people in their cities are literally dying from heat because they don't they're especially the vulnerable who can't afford air conditioning. And and it's it sounds you know like oh what a few trees is going to make a difference. Actually yes if you have those cooler areas and that shaded areas and space for people to go because inside their homes it's it's like an oven outside their homes is like an oven so they need somewhere else where the the heat is regulated and i think that's going to be a big important element of this certainly in, in you know southern uh european countries but as i say get pretty warm here as well you know and people do seek shade any interest in asking questions yes sir at the back do you like the microphone there so people online yes. can hear you as well? My name is Patrick Kyo, uh, a member of the Institute. I come from a farming background in County Carlo. Um, I would, you know, your presentation is very good, very interesting. And uh, I suppose I have just a question in relation to, as I understand it, um, the carbon targets for agriculture are separate from those that will be set for land use, land use change, forestry. And um, the same people are largely involved in the two these two categories. Mm -hmm. And my question really is, if to the extent that there is re-wetting done under land use, land use change uh, programs, will the carbon reduction in carbon emissions arising from re-wetting be credited to the targets in the agriculture sector who are obliged, as we all know, to reduce carbon emissions by something up the order of 25% by, by 2030. Um, well, if, if the actions on the land use element result in a, um, let's say, a, a movement of, of livestock or change in practices on the land, for example, less fertilizer application or you know, less livestock, then the, the credits will, will go to the agriculture sector, but also will it won't be double accounting as such but the agriculture model counts them in a way that it looks at at the 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 activity on the farm if you like whereas the land use looks at whether the land is will be looking at whether the land is drained or not does it have forestry on it um uh, what type of crops maybe are on it for for different me measures so in one sense you're right that the the same landowners are going to be responsible for all of that and you know there's some argument why not just throw it all into the same pot but i think you know the way it's been worked out at a european level they do want us to keep them separate it is the same people ultimately um and while we're looking at um, i suppose maybe clever technologies to reduce reduce the emissions ultimately the land use sector is about sort of increasing the sequestration rather than well also reducing the emissions certainly from pt type soils but you know the data isn't quite there yet you know it doesn't mean we wait for the data to be absolutely perfect before we do anything we do roughly know the direction of travel here but i mean even data last week from chagas indica has indicated now it's not on all of the peatlands but on a fairly sizable proportion of it that maybe we've overestimated but we don't know what's happening on on mineral soils for example as opposed to pt soil so there, there's a lot of information still to be got but we we have a rough idea of what we should be doing and we can we can be starting that now i think that's what's important yes um woman over there and then the man here thank you minister um and for your really strong words and message to to meps tomorrow it's really welcome 
um, always. And I would also suggest if um, if anyone in the room is interested, um, Birdwich Ireland held a webinar last Monday on um, hosted by Dr. Flo Renu Wilson, a peatland expert on the science of raising the water table. And um, that's on our YouTube channel, the Birdwich Ireland YouTube channel, and is highly, highly relevant to this discussion and really worth looking at. And there was a few farmers also um, on that webinar who were very interested. And I think that's been one of the issues is not enough information out there on the science of it and to allay concerns. Um, but that is one, one, uh, one help along this journey, um, but really welcome words, Minister. Can I just ask you though, in relation to restoring nature, um, we have concerns, Minister, as you know, at Birdwatch Ireland in relation to the draft deforestation program. Um, and it's the draft that went out to public consultation is utterly failing to protect the biodiversity that we have on high nature value farmland. And so we're very concerned that um, we will lose several bird species, for example, the curlew and a range of other species, as well as more pollinators, including bees and semi-natural grasslands that some of these suckler farmers are restoring right now and working hard for. Um, but um, there's no safeguards in the afforestation program and we have solutions. But if we don't have those safeguards in the draft afforestation program, our restoration target is going to be much harder to achieve down the road. And that's a big concern is that what we're doing now is so potentially damaging, it will make our restoration targets seem further and further away. In fact, in between, we could lose several species to extinction. And that is a doomsday scenario. So, Minister, just wanted to see if how can we reconcile that? How can you reconcile that? Would you include those safeguards in your draft afforestation program so that we don't have a bigger problem down the road? Thank you. You didn't give your name at the start. I, I, I know your name. Una you, Duggan, Head of Advocacy at Birdwatch Ireland. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Una. And I, I've, I, I haven't seen the, the um, webinar yet, but I, I will. I've heard a good few positive comments about it, so I, I look forward to looking at that. Um, I know forestry is a, an incredibly contentious issue in Ireland um, across the board, to be honest. Um, and it's um, we've really strived to try and write a programme that is different from previous programmes, that is um, trying to make that shift towards more nature-friendly forestry, trying to almost at the same time address some of those legacy issues and nobody wants we don't want to lose the curly we don't want to lose any waders or any farmland birds through our actions we have to really absolutely not do that i mean we, we we know we've done that already we have to improve on that we have to not not do that in the future um the we've been ex engaging extensively with the commission since the the, the draft program went to public consultation so there has been an over and back process we're still not complete at that that is to the frustration of many but still we, we need to get this right you know we have to spend the time to make sure this is right and that this, this program is different from previous programs um it is an evolution it's going to be a five-year forestry program in five years time probably four and a half years at this rate there'll be another program there'll be a midterm review so i think it's important now we keep this under review under tight um watch as to what impact it's having we also need to try and rectify some of those um legacy issues some of the fault problems you know the issues we've we've now facing because of bad decisions in the past and maybe it's unfair to say bad decisions just we didn't know a lot of the stuff we know now. We didn't know a lot of the maybe things 30, 40 years ago that we now know. And we do have to rectify those. And that is part of nature restoration too. But certainly we don't want to lose any more, you know, lower any numbers than they already are. We already know the curlew is, you know, most threatened really. But across the board, there are other birds under significant threat. Will you include those safeguards, Minister? I, because I you haven't answered the question. You haven't answered the question. I don't know. We, 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 we don't. With the commission yeah. on this yeah thank you very much Mr. yeah gentleman here thank you uh good afternoon minister james stain solicitor i specialize in agri law and all my clients are in that sector um a couple of observations and maybe one point uh, again the the irish farming community as you said are, are engaging in the in in the climate change action and i do think of all the sectors they're probably the most likely to hit and possibly even succeed or exceed our targets, particularly when the correct science is applied in terms of measurement. And you raised there, Chagas have reviewed okay. some of the figures. Um, you raised a point there, which is which is interesting. We said that farmers had always farmers haven't effectively taken into account the social cost 
or indeed environmental costs that are far in over the years because the system drove them that way. But unfortunately, what I see is the concern of many farmers is that the, the social cost that is now going to be there, they're the ones who are going to have to carry it and it will not be society, it will not be the consumers who are going to have to pay more to get the food off the land because it's producing less. Um, you raised a point there, and, and I think we're probably all in agreement on this, uh, cap, it, it, there has been poor communication, I think, by this for the government. On one hand, there's been uh, statements made that there will be additional cap funding. The next day, the commission, I think, will say there won't be any. And the question is, is how is this going to be funded? I have a lot of clients who uh, were had their lands put into SECs. They got paid grants for a number of years to stop in 2011. There's been some additional funding. But I have a number of clients who have no value in their land because it's in an SEC and in others because of the phenomenal level of restrictions and the process that's required to do the simplest thing in the land. You simply don't bother. They have quite a serious loss of production. And these are people who do accept the need for, you know, for, for minding the environment and they're very good at that. And I do think that is a serious challenge that the government is going to face is how is this funded? Because at the moment, I don't see anything there that would encourage uh, my clients to look at that positively, that this will be funded going forward. Um, no, it's, it's a valid point. I think across the board, you know, from, from NGOs to farm orgs, everyone is sort of pretty much calling for like, what's the story here? I mean, this is no. we as a society, whether European or, or domestic, either value this enough to, to support it or we don't. You know, we value education, we value health, we value all these other sectors. We either are serious about valuing um, nature restoration or carbon sequestration, whatever you want from, in a natural um, basis, or we're not. And at the moment, you, you know, you're right. We don't really value it. You know, we, we do like to value it, but, you know, when it comes down to sort of hard cash to put a value on it, that's what we need to do. Um, I mean, there are groups working on the sort of natural capital value of, of ecosystem services. And, you know, at least then you might be able to put a figure on it and say to governments or to, to private entities or whatever you know if you want to you want to do business in Ireland and avail of our lovely you know temperate climate and our educated system you know maybe we need to take some of your money and invest it in in uh not saying that's what we're doing but you know that's one idea but certainly the state needs to consider how it values this incidentally though but your, your average sort of beef farm or sheep farmer in the country is, is losing money from their production model you'll know yourself their their direct payment makes up like 150% of their income, like their mm. actual owning and managing their cattle and sheep loses the money. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a balance there that they could go a little bit of the way and they'd retain, they retained 100% of their direct payments and broke even on the production, they'd still be quids in, but that's separate in one sense. But certainly there are divides in, in agriculture um, and, and, you know, it's quite a broad range of, of incomes from top to bottom. I mean, I don't think any other sector mm. would have such a diverse but, you know, uh, is, is... spectrum. Is it isn't it the case, or is is it the case that, uh, speaking as a pure or urbanite, but you know that the rewetting process doesn't necessarily. I thought I think I read somewhere it doesn't necessarily mean that the land is thereby completely removed from the potential to be farmed. I mean, it's not it's not all or nothing, is it? I mean, if um, it's a, potentially it isn't all or nothing and at the moment anyone even with drained peaty soil has no animals out on that in the winter they're all in a shed for a start I mean most animals in Ireland are are, are indoors for four to six months of the year mm. um, very rare farms you might be able to you know maybe sheep obviously you outwinter sheep most mm. of the time but cattle heavier animals are in so it might well mean that that though that land might be less available potentially in in the summer months but it, it might well mean there's some grazing that can be done and maybe should be done because in certain areas you need that balance mm. of farming and grazing at the right time to, to support um, species of animals and, and certain bird species and you know without that take the animals away you lose that special habitat as well but these are some of the balances that need to be struck um, and this is where we do need the knowledge it's not um, you know abandon the land and, and let it flood and off you go no mm. Mm. any further Questions are John. Would you like to come back briefly? Generation Minister, I'm uh, about it, uh, being personal, but I, I like many farmers, have a lot of forestry. Uh, but we get no credit for the carbon we sequester in our forests. We we'll get um, I will, yeah, nice say, from the government. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't, no, don't. I mean, you know, I think there's a fair, there's a point about I fairness don't. here. Um, we, you know, and many farmers see it that they're getting blame for 
the carbon that's released from their grazing or whatever, but no credit for the for the forestry lands that are sequestered. And quite a few farmers in the part of the world that I live in, including myself, went for a scheme that uh, Minister Coughlin introduced some years ago, which was if you if you put half your farm into forestry, there was a there was a very good incentive under reps at that time, etc. And I participated in it. And, and, yeah. and you know, used trees, uh, deciduous trees, the ash. Now the damn thing's dying. And we have no policy as to how to deal with that. So I'd appeal to you, Minister. Um, look, I think, look, ash dieback is a, a massive challenge, not only to those who have planted ash, but also in a wider um, diversity, wider diversity sense that I think a quarter of trees across Ireland are either in hedges or in trees are ash, and they're, they're pretty much all going to die, which is horrific. And so, so as an initial stage, we have had a number of ash dieback schemes. They've been, you know, some have availed them, some haven't. Um, we're re I'm currently reviewing that again, but I do think we do need to keep an eye on the on the bigger, wide, um, countrywide scale of where ash is going and what what we're going to do because that's a lot of lot of trees um, and a lot of hedgerows that are going to be you know decimated because of it. Um, you had another point. Hold on, hold oh, on right, that sorry. point because I, for some reason, oh, yeah, wasn't looking at what wasn't paying attention to uh, uh, sufficiently to the questions that were coming in online. Um, but that's that's my fault. So I'm going to run through two or three of them really okay. fast because I do did want I did promise we finished at six thirty, so I'm not going to let it go much beyond that. But I, I just want to give a flavour of what's mm -hmm. come in, and perhaps if I read two or three of them out, you might just pick one that you like. Okay. <laughs> it's also a nice position to be in, and you have a choice. But Maple Keith, environmental sustainability uh, sustainability analyst at Accenture, asks, could you run a similar scheme to the Woodland Environmental Fund? for farmers and landowners. Nice, uh, interesting suggestion. Ruth McGrath from the uh, Department of Public Expenditure and Reform asks, is there a challenge to re-wetting peatlands if wind farms are located on them? I raised that question earlier as to whether the two could coexist. I think you, 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 you did address that. That's an interesting, uh, an interesting insight from, from uh, Ruth. Um, um, Brian Daly of KPMG, he's an IAA board member. When the minister refers to a future when farmers are expected to more for society with their land and produce food, does she have specific proposals on how they get paid for these other activities? Uh, how much and by whom? So again, that's, I suppose, he's putting that out there, Brian, is uh, for you to think about. And you have touched on some of that already. And Ty Gomani, senior scientific officer from the EPA, asks, what emphasis is there in the regulation on potential restoration activities in coastal and marine areas? To deliver an overall on to deliver on overall restoration targets. So there's two or three things there. Okay. Um, um, I, might, I think the middle two we sort of dealt. Yes, with. exactly, exactly. So maybe the last one and the first one. It's, it's key, like I mean, yes. I, but I think it ultimately comes down to society or, and and governments and states valuing what sure. we get from it. You know, and there are figures like you know for every you know, I don't know, four or one euro invested, you get a massive re return, potential return in, in terms of savings and other aspects. You know, sure. we spend billion euros, you know, billions on, on water quality and keeping water healthy for us to, to drink. Yeah. I mean, you know, if there could be co-benefits there. The na or the um, Woodland Environment Fund is an interesting model. It's where we, where farmers can plant a, a native woodland and we encourage um, corporations and businesses to, to support that. So they top up the farmers in the first year. Every For every hectare they he or she plants, they get an extra 1,000 euros for that year. So it's a little, it's an incentive. To be honest, I think it's it's too small a figure because these, these companies get years and years and years and years and decades of, of advertising from it, saying, look at the woodland we helped grow. So I think there's, there is something there. And whether it's certainly something like that for nature restoration, I don't think it's beyond the realms of, 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 of fantasy at all, you know, and maybe that's the sort of route we we need to take um, to try and draw down. I mean, there's plenty of money in the world just trying to get it into the right place, isn't it? Sure. You know, well, so balance the, that out again. The challenge for the political uh, system. Uh, yes, comes, yes. yeah. Comes. Attention restoration activities, coastal and marine areas, yeah. I mean, that, is, that is another key area in it. I haven't gone into the, the detail of it here and I don't have the specifics of it, but yeah, marine areas and coastal areas are, are, are vital and even in terms of um, I'm sure Una would allude to in terms of bird habitats and, and keeping those for, for you know, birds to, 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 to live or breed and, and come and 
if they're migrant birds. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not detailed enough on mm. it, but yeah, absolutely in there. Minister, thank you very much. You've been terrific. Um, there's a huge amount of interest. As often happens, it gets bunched towards the end. So there are people putting in questions online here. That's what tends to happen. We, we just want to thank you for being here. We and the Institute here are very, very keen to be involved in this, all of this public debate and public discussion. And particularly Mr. Staines, others were saying about, you know, there may be people who wouldn't necessarily have um, been used to contributing to debates of the IIEA. We want them to be contributing. We want, you know, we want all interests. Um, we want to ensure that we're, you know, we can be a, to, you, to coin that phrase, safe space and, a, a, and an opportunity for people to discuss things that they might themselves feel that on one view they're victims of, but we want people to see the IAA as an opportunity for us to have a really good debate and discussion, and sometimes even robust discussion as between government and others, because everybody says, or at least people claim, that um, there's a universal uh, wish to make progress, but not necessarily always in the same way uh, 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 as, as, as government might like, or as quickly as government might like, or. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 parties and government might like to see, but we think that we could have a role in, in that. So we're really delighted that you were here for, you. with us this afternoon. Um, I was going to just yeah. request, could I see, could you yes. save those questions? By all means, we we'll send them on to you. To yeah, hear, absolutely. Hear yeah, like for sure, questions. for sure. I, well, I did Thank promise you. to finish at 6.30. I have a kind of a rule that I impose on myself. You say you finished, you should finish. People have other things to do. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much. Well done, thank you. Yeah.